What does it mean to live a liturgical life, a vita liturgica, in the midst of the modern wasteland? The holy rites are our lifeline, our umbilical cord to Holy Mother Church. They keep us nourished and safe in the valley of the shadow of death. The original Death Valley is not in California, but in hell. Hell is truly the valley of death, because one who lives there, or rather continuously dies there, is stuck down in the depths and cannot get up to the high places, up to Mount Zion and the city of the living God. Scripture calls the fallen world in which we men are living the valley of the shadow of death, because it is under the power, limited and destined to fail, but nonetheless real, of the evil one. Hence, when we examine what is the case in Satan's kingdom, we will also acquire a better understanding of how he is attempting to undermine us here in this world. Hell has no liturgy. The fallen angels have no common work of charity, no common work of divine worship. When the devil appeared to the desert father Abba Apollo, he had no knees, as if to say he is incapable of kneeling. His mentality is non serviam, I will not serve, and all the demons think the same way. You could call it mindful conformism. For this reason, there is no proper hierarchy in hell. They are more like bandits who stick together out of self-interest. Contrary to the prevailing democratic way of thinking, liturgy is essentially connected with hierarchy. Christ, the high priest, is the one who leads the worship, and he deigns to allow the participation of the priest, the deacon, the subdeacon, the ministers, the cantors, the choir, the laity, each in his or their own place and function. One cannot demand or create a liturgical role. One rather receives it and enters into it. To be liturgical is to submit freely to an external rule, an order not of our own making, a complex whole of which we are humble parts. Liturgy takes us beyond ourselves into roles that are not simply inborn or inherited or fashioned, into realms that are off limits for mere creatures, into actions and passions that are supernatural in both their source and their goal. When we chant the liturgy, we are standing outside ourselves in the heavenly place. Our feet were standing in thy courts, O Jerusalem. Given how intimately bound up our human nature, rationality, and language, our very action of placing on our lips words originated by another is a reformation of our humanity, a putting on of Christ, a renunciation of the ambitions of Babel, and a quiet welcoming of the spirit of Pentecost. For all these reasons, the devil has and can have no liturgy. Although he is compelled to submit to the rule of the Almighty, he does not wish to submit and therefore cannot enter into the joy of his Lord. He recognizes no other rule but his own will, which is why there is no peace in hell. He has not the humility to allow himself to be placed as a part in a larger whole and to take for his own the words of another. He has no desire to suffer the ecstasy of love. As our Lord says in St. John's Gospel, he, the devil, was a murderer from the beginning, and he stood not in the truth, because truth is not in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father thereof. Jesus speaks here with metaphysical and psychological precision. The devil is a murderer because he envies God's life and takes it away from those who have it rather than receiving God's life as a gift and promoting the reception of the same gift in others. He stands not in the truth, because truth 
for a creature is always the harmony between the intellect and its object. To, as the scholastics put it, ad equatio rei et intellectus. Such that the intellect is measured by the reality outside itself. The created intellect has truth, it contains truth, but it cannot be the truth, for that is God's prerogative alone. In this sense, truth can only be in us, but never of us, as if we were its origin or measure. Hence, the person who rejects the truth of God ends up evicting truth from his mind and begins a career of falsification, both in the form of self-deception We see how the devil throughout the Gospels, and indeed across all of history, acts as if he could actually defeat Jesus. And in the form of deception of others, we see how the father of lies whips people into a frenzy of lying, manipulation, and conformism. The devil and any of his imitators speaketh of his own. He will speak only the shallow worldly wisdom that is his mental content. He will spout sophistry, banality, and cynicism. That is what comes of not being willing to take for his own the wiser, deeper, brighter, truer words of another, his creator. Lucifer, as his very name implies, it means bearer of light, was created to mirror the word, and in this way to be resplendently beautiful in his own nature. He abandoned the word and thus became ugly in spite of his wondrous nature. Think about a lake. A lake, when still, can take on the form of mountains against an evening sky. And in this way, the lake goes beyond its nature of water to partake of the natures of earth, air, and fire. In contrast, a lake, when turbulent and muddy, seems in some way to lose the better virtues of water itself, its purity, transparency, ability to wash, ability to slake thirst. The clear lake in its reflection becomes more than itself. The muddy lake in its turbidity becomes less than itself. A Dominican theologian once remarked, that is the theology behind the story of the Garden of Eden. There was no way that human beings could be simply human. They had to be either superhuman or inhuman. One of the great antiphons for the Feast of Pentecost vigorously conveys this truth. Repleti sunt omnes spiritus sancto et ceperunt loqui, alleluia, alleluia. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak, alleluia, alleluia. We must first be filled with the Spirit of God before we have anything worthwhile to say. And our first words as newborn infants will be, Alleluia, Alleluia, that is, praise the Lord. This, therefore, will be the newborn church's first word, a word of pure praise offered to God like sweet incense. The psalmist exclaims, Ex ore infantium et lactentium perfecisti laudem. Out of the mouths of infants and nursing babes, thou hast perfected praise, because of thy enemies, that thou mayest destroy the enemy and the avenger. Etym- etymologically, the word infans, from which we get our word infant, means the one who cannot speak the one who must learn how to speak by constantly listening to his mother, receiving language from her mouth as he receives milk from her breast. This life of dependency thwarts the advance of the enemy, Lucifer, who, unlike the child, grasps at an impossible independence and will not praise the Lord. As for the Christian, so for the church. Whenever she wishes to live in the prime of her youth, she will give first place to offering up the sacrifice of praise. When we are animated by the Spirit, we speak the sacrifice of praise. We become the sacrifice. Conversely, when we speak of ourselves, this means both from ourselves and about ourselves, we speak nothing but a lie. 
If the church takes as her priority anything other than the sacred liturgy worthily celebrated, she abandons her first love and starts down a path of harlotry, like ancient Israel playing the whore with the false gods of the surrounding nations. There is a direct line connecting Babel to Canaan, to Babylon, to Gehenna. First, there is Babel. When we abandon sacred tradition, which unites us to one another, to the host of saints, and to the transcendent God, our penalty is a babel of vernacular tongues, a smorgasbord of options, an incoherent pluralism in the Ars Celebrandi, or style of celebrating. Second, there is Canaan. Our bad liturgical mentality and habits are a breeding ground for open and hidden forms of adultery, idolatry, atheism, and apostasy. Third, there is Babylon. We enter into captivity to our enemies, the world, the flesh, and the devil. We enter into exile, far from the fatherland, far from our own identity. We are dwelling in the furthest regio de similitudinis, in a condition of existential alienation accompanied by an utter lack of willpower to regain our home, to live up to sacrificial demands, or to bring our fellow men to the good. Fourth, and lastly, in this descent, there is Gehenna, the valley of burning garbage, the image of hell. This entire downward spiral from, Ca- from Babel to Canaan to Babylon to Gehenna is a spiral of increasing self-indulgence and decreasing discipline. One is dispersed, wasted, spread out, thinned out, until one is a caricature of one's former substantial self. Such is what we have seen, not only with the liturgy, but also with the priesthood, religious life, the missions, catechesis, the fine arts. When one gives up the supersubstantial bread of tradition with the Most Holy Eucharist at its heart, one makes a descent from gourmet food to fast food to starvation. So the path of ascent must take the form of positive self-denial in imitation of Christ and for the sake of transformation in Him. This is why any movement away from asceticism, any lessening of customary church-wide burdens of penance, is also from the evil one. This would include the gradual reduction of the Eucharistic fast in the 20th century, and the abolition of Septuagesima, or pre-Lent, and the Lenten fast by Paul VI. If the smoke of Satan has emerged out of some fissure in the temple of God, as the same pope admitted, Who allowed that fissure to open up in the first place? Whence came the weakness of the structure? More generally, who thought it could ever be a good idea to open the windows of the church to let in the polluted air outside? The devil normally stays away from holy places. He must have been given an invitation he couldn't refuse. The laxity of the contemporary church and the rise in satanic phenomena are by no means unrelated. Given that liturgy is hierarchical, otherworldly, ecstatic, and absolute in its demands over us, it is entirely in keeping with the devil's strategy to destabilize, democratize, secularize, and relativize the liturgy here on earth. He seeks to loosen our bond with a fixed and efficacious tradition. Distinctions between sacred and profane, formal and informal, fitting and unfitting, these the devil tries to smudge and eventually obliterate. He seeks to darken or blot out the manifestation of the heavenly hierarchy in the earthly distinctions of sacred ministers and their complementary but non-interchangeable roles. He seeks to persuade us, particularly the clergy, that the liturgy is not the font and apex of the Christian life, but only one means among many for advancing a so-called Christian agenda. The devil knows he cannot prevent some advancement of the Christian faith, 
but he is well aware that nothing comes close to the liturgy's power for hallowing the name of God and establishing his kingdom in our midst, giving us our daily nourishment and moving us to the forgiveness of sins and the avoidance of sins. In truth, liturgy is an end in itself because it is God's peculiar possession and makes us his peculiar possession. If the devil can convince us that liturgy is not an end in itself, that it is a helpful tool we should manipulate for ulterior ends, then he has already won half the battle for souls. He has shaken our fundamental orientation to the heavenly Jerusalem and to the kingdom that will have no end. If angels had bodies, the good angels would sing, dance, paint, sculpt, and build beautifully. As it is, they might view our bodily religion with a holy envy, since we have a way to externalize our interior devotion, to give a semi-permanent being to our thoughts and feelings as monuments of faith and witnesses to truth, speaking a word made flesh in a distant likeness to the incarnation of the word. When we build a church, For example, we're doing something that the angels can't do. With a correct instinct, Fra Angelico has depicted angels dancing circle dances with holy souls in the garden of heaven. But the evil angels would not sing. They could not execute the demanding and liberating dance of the liturgy. They could not paint, sculpt, or build. If they attempted to do any of these things, it would run along the lines of atonal music, abstract expressionism, primitivism, and postmodernism, only even worse. As a modern author has said, all the artist can produce with entire originality is disorder. It is as true in art as it is in morality that everyone who speaks out of himself is a liar. In sharp contrast, is the Son of God, who said, I do nothing of myself, but as the Father hath taught me, these things I speak. Our Lord emphasizes this point in patiently varied language. He says, For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father who sent me, he gave me commandment what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. The things, therefore, that I speak, even as the Father said unto me, so do I speak. The words that I speak to you, I speak not of myself, but the Father who abideth in me, he doth the works. Our Lord goes so far as to say in the fifth chapter of John, I cannot do anything of myself. Or as another translation has it, I am able to do nothing from myself. Those quotations were from St. John chapters 8, 12, 14, and 5, so all over the place in the Gospel of John. The exact instructions given under the Old Covenant for the priests and their worship, occupying a large part of the Pentateuch, are given for a permanent reason. They are not superseded in the New Covenant, but fulfilled perfectly in Christ, in whom the infinite and eternal word of God, sovereignly free, is bound permanently and singularly to this human flesh, this face, these hands, this heart, this voice, and who communicates his singularity to us in the form of liturgical traditions developed under the guidance of his Holy Spirit. This is why our Lord tells us, He that shall break one of these least commandments and shall so teach men shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But he that shall do and teach, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. The church's liturgy applies this verse to her saints who are still doing and teaching the least of the commandments in their Christian transposition and meaning. As our model, let us ponder the Son of God praying the Psalms of David as he grew up in the home of Mary and Joseph. What a spectacle! The new Adam, father of the world to come, praying the old Psalms of a child of Adam. 
The word who enlightens all men and inspires the prophets is the very author of these psalms. No less than the heavens and the earth and all the host of them, the psalms are his own creation. Yet, the word made flesh submits to these words as prayers already there, which he planted in history for the formation of his own sacred heart, for giving his lips and lungs and vocal cords their best exercise, for joining him as fully as possible with the people of Israel and the human condition he assumed. He subordinated his divine freedom to liturgical tradition. This is what Christ shows us. Since we are all little images of the image of the Father, the Psalms are given to us, too, as the vehicle of our innermost thoughts and feelings, so that shaped by them, we may express what is deepest and truest in us, in our human nature divinized. We, in like manner, submit our freedom to liturgical tradition as part of the imitation of Christ. One of the great strengths of the traditional Latin liturgy is that it leaves nothing to the will or imagination of the priest. And the same may be said of every minister in the sanctuary. It choreographs his moves, dictates his words, shapes his mind and heart to itself to make it utterly clear that it is Christ who is acting in and through him. Father Stefan Dupre of the Priestly Fraternity of St. Peter once said, quote, In the traditional liturgy, I am a slave. The church tells me where to place my hands, where, where to stand, when to genuflect, when to kiss the altar. In this way, I am no longer free to do my own will, and Christ's priesthood is able to act through me. Unquote. Or in the words of the psalmist, Know ye that the Lord, he is God. He made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Sheep are to follow the lead of their shepherd. The clergy is not and will never be the first principle of the liturgy. As St. Thomas Aquinas says with sobering humility, the priest or other cleric is an animated instrument of the eternal high priest. Thomas says, holy orders does not constitute a principal agent, but a minister and a certain instrument of divine operation. Ministers are like rational hammers or chisels or saws by which a greater artisan will accomplish his work of sanctification while conferring on them the dignity of resting in his hand and partaking of his action. Here is how Monsignor Ronald Knox expresses it. The philosopher Aristotle, in defining the position of a slave, uses the words, a slave is a living tool. And that is what a priest is, a living tool of Jesus Christ. He lends his hands to be Christ's hands, his voice to be Christ's voice, his thoughts to be Christ's thoughts. There is... There should be nothing of himself in it from first to last, except where the church graciously permits him to dwell for a moment in silence on his own special intentions for the good estate of the living and the dead. Those who are not of our religion are puzzled sometimes or even scandalized by witnessing the ceremonies of the Mass. Of course, he's talking about this is written in the 50s, right? It is all, they say, so mechanical But you see, it ought to be mechanical. They are watching not a man, but a living tool. It turns this way and that, bends, straightens itself, gesticulates, all in obedience to a preconceived order. Christ's order, not ours. The Mass is best said, we Catholics know it, when it is said so that you do not notice how it is said. We do not expect eccentricities from a tool, the tool of Christ. That's Monsignor Knox. The clergy are privileged tools, to be sure, but they are still tools. And the liturgy remains the work of Christ, the high craftsman, the carpenter of the Ark of the Covenant, the architect of the heavenly Jerusalem, the new song and its cantor. In its external form, in text, 
and music and ceremonial, the liturgy should luminously proclaim that it is the work of Christ and his church, not the product of a charismatic individual or a grassroots community. John Henry Newman expressed this point with his usual eloquence. Clad in his sacerdotal vestments, he, the minister of the sacraments, sinks what is individual in himself altogether and is but the representative of him from whom he derives his commission. His words, his tones, his actions, his presence lose their personality. One bishop, one priest is like another. They all chant the same notes and observe the same genuflections as they give one peace and one blessing, as they offer one and the same sacrifice. The Mass must not be said without a missal under the priest's eye, nor in any language but that, namely Latin, in which it has come down to us from the early hierarchs of the Western Church. That's Newman. Even when still an Anglican, Newman had recognized the truth that the liturgical minister is conformed by his office to delivering faithfully and humbly the message of another, and in the other's words, without, without distracting personal touches or idiosyncratic variations. This is again Newman. As the words in which we pray in church are not our own, neither will our looks or our postures, or our thoughts be our own. We shall, in the prophet's words, do not our own ways, not do our own ways there, nor find our own pleasure, nor speak our own words. In imitation of all saints before us, including the holy apostles, who never spoke their own words in solemn worship, but either those which Christ taught them, or which the Holy Ghost taught them, or which the Old Testament taught them. This is the reason why we always pray from a book in church, The apostles said to Christ, Lord, teach us to pray. And our Lord graciously gave them the prayer called the Lord's Prayer. For the same reason, we too use the Lord's Prayer, and we use the Psalms of David and of other holy men, and hymns which are given us in Scripture, thinking it better to use the words of inspired prophets than our own. Thus Newman. We find this attitude throughout the rule of St. Benedict. The patriarch of monks gives as the very root of humility that a man must live not by his own desires and passions, but by the judgment and bidding of another. In his brisk Latin, ambulantes alieno judicio et imperio. When St. Benedict comes around to ordering the monastic liturgy, he makes continual reference to how things are done elsewhere. The psalms prayed by our fathers, the Ambrosian hymn, the canticles used by the Church of Rome. Even when fashioning his own monastic cycle of prayer, he is constantly looking to the models already in existence. This is the true spirit of liturgical conservatism, piety towards elders and the imitation of Christ. We are not the ones who determine the shape of our worship. We receive it in humility as an alien judgment that we make our own. To do otherwise is to put the axe to the tree of humility. In like manner, chapter 7 of St. Benedict's Rule warns us against doing our own will, lest we become corrupt and abominable. Liturgical prayer has always been the foremost way of inculcating submission to Christ and his church, so that we can learn his ways and assimilate his prayer and drink of his wisdom, which will certainly not be something we ourselves could have cooked up. Thus, we take his yoke upon us, the yoke of tradition. Prior to the middle of the 20th century, it was taken for granted in Catholic circles that it is a special perfection of the sacred liturgy to be fixed, constant, stable, and immovable rock on which to build one's spiritual life. That was not taken as a weakness. That was taken as a perfection, that it never changed. The liturgy's numerous and exacting rubrics were understood as guiding the celebrant along a prayerful path of submissive obedience in which he could submerge his personality into the person of Christ and merge his individual voice with the chorus of the church at prayer. 
The formal hieratic gestures transmitted an eternally fresh symbolism while limiting, if not eliminating, the danger of subjectivism and emotionalism. The priest or other minister was conformed to Christ the servant who came not to do his own will, but the will of him who sent him. He is commanded what to speak and what to do. He never speaks of himself. The Father who abides in the Son does the work of the Son, and the Son who abides in the priest does the work of the priest. In this way, even as the Son was emptied of glory in taking on the form of a slave, so too is the priest emptied of human glory as he takes on the form of a servant, sharing the hiddenness, humiliation, passion, and death of Christ which is, of course, what the essence of the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass is. As we saw earlier, our Lord, the great high priest of the New Covenant, said, I cannot do anything of myself. Here we have perhaps the most radical statement of the priests being tethered to the liturgy. It is a tethering so complete that he may truthfully say, I cannot do otherwise. I am constrained from above. If he thinks or acts differently, he has not yet become a slave, in imitation of the one who assumed the likeness of a slave. Worse, if he is allowed, if he's allowed or encouraged to do otherwise by a liturgical book, that book is a dirty or fractured mirror that does not reflect the word. Bishop Athanasius Schneider was once asked in an interview what lessons he has learned from celebrating the traditional form of the Mass. Here is the bishop's revealing response. Quote, The deepest lesson I have learned from celebrating the traditional form of the Mass is this. I am only a poor instrument of a supernatural and utmost sacred action whose principal celebrant is Christ, the eternal high priest, I feel that during the celebration of the Mass, I lose, in some sense, my individual freedom, for the words and the gestures are prescribed, even in their smallest details, and I am not able to dispose of them as I will. I feel most deeply in my heart that I am only a servant and a minister who yet, with free will, with faith and love, fulfill not my will, but the will of another." Unquote. How much does a priest stand to gain or lose by his cooperation or lack of cooperation with the smallest details of the liturgical rite bequeathed to him by tradition and ecclesiastical law? What's at stake? To find an answer, let us turn to a great writer of the golden age of French spirituality, Catherine de Bar. She lived from 1614 to 1698 or in religious life, as she was called, Mother Mechtilde of the Blessed Sacrament. In her correspondence with the Countess of Chateauvieux, Mother Mechtilde writes, quote, The first thing I notice in you, my dearest daughter, is that you do not have enough esteem for small things. You do not envision them with the, within the order of divine providence. That is why you have little attention and respect for them, and in this you lose a great deal of grace. God sometimes asks only for a small act of fidelity in order to make us great saints. You must always be in a state of holy and loving attention toward God to give yourself to him in every way. If you could comprehend the waste you bring about when you act in a purely human way, you would be inconsolable. Is it not a great fault in a soul who is capable of giving glory to God and who nevertheless deprives him of it so as to yield to her own reasoning, which wants to convince her that life's small actions are mere nothings and do not need to be directed? O my child, if you had really understood how you were ransomed and how you belong to Jesus Christ, you would take much more care about honoring him. If not even one beat of your heart belongs to you, then so much the more your smallest action, which always lasts longer than one heartbeat." 
In these words, we find a striking anticipation of the better-known little way of St. Therese of Lisieux. Mother Mechthild sees clearly that small acts of fidelity are the proving ground of our desire to be great saints, and that we should try never to act in a purely human way out of our own creaturely resources. Applying Mother Mechthild's doctrine to Monsignor Knox's comparison and Bishop Schneider's experience, we can arrive at a new insight into the enormous spiritual benefits of the traditional Roman liturgy for the ministers who submit to its thousand little demands, which are occasions for placing them in a state of holy and loving attention towards God. Not one word or motion is considered a mere nothing, a trifle that does not need to be directed. All actions are ordered to honoring him. Mother Mechtild amplifies this point in another passage from the same correspondence with the Countess. Quote, The Gospel tells us today briefly in what Christian holiness consists. It is a wonderful lesson. Listen to this, please. The law says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind. Weigh these things well, and you will see how much you are obliged to give God the very smallest of your actions. You will find in an endless number of places in Holy Scripture your inability to dispose of yourself, indeed of even one of your thoughts, if you do not want to steal it from Jesus Christ. For by right you cannot. You have been purchased. The one who buys the tree buys the fruit. Hence, you are not yours at all. Ponder this truth and repeat these words often. I am not mine. I belong to Jesus Christ. He ransomed me through love. Thus, I am necessarily the slave of his love. O worthy slavery. She continues. You see next how much you are obliged to give yourself to him. That is, to consent to all the rights, powers, and authority he has over you and to abide in him. This means to never depart from his holy presence and to do all things by his spirit. As much as is possible for you to never have in your ideas any other object than him. Briefly, in everything, his pure glory must be the reason you act, even in your smallest actions. Do not think that there is anything small in regard to God. All is great. All is holy. His love sanctifies all things. Therefore, be very exact in the smallest things. All is done for a great God. You must do everything with understanding, that is to say, with attention to God and with a simple desire to glorify and please Him in all things. He wants you to have this fidelity in the smallest things, and then He will raise you to greater ones. The man who does not pay attention to little things will soon fall into great disorders. Do not consider little things with the perspective of your human mind. You must have a prompt obedience without considering the littleness of the action. The slave has no right of choosing or refusing. She must be subject at every moment without knowing why. Therefore, love faithfulness in little things and remain subject to it. You can glorify God more by picking up a straw out of submission to God than by doing 50 lashes with the discipline or other greater austerities following your own mind. If God is pleased with these little things, you must do them purely and with the same perfection, the same love, and the same fidelity as if you were converting the whole world. What I, that's all Mother Mechthild. What I love about reading old saints like this is that she's already got the, the little way of St. Therese 200 years before St. Therese ever talked about it. But of course, nobody has heard of Mother Mechthild of the Blessed Sacrament. Everybody has heard of St. Therese. And that's because St. Therese popularized it. She found a way, she found a way to speak about it that modern people could, could really hear and assimilate. But it's all there in Mother Mechthild. And you can see she's really hammering on this point of, of, of the smallest things, be faithful in the smallest things. Nothing should be left to chance. Nothing should be considered a trifle that has no value in God's eyes. How compelling is Mother Mechthild's doctrine of holy slavery to Christ 
expressed in the constant giving over of every little thing, every small act done for the great God, the Lord of heaven and earth. We cannot fail to be reminded of the words of Christ. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in that which is greater. And he that is unjust in that which is little is unjust also in that which is greater. Note Christ's emphasis on justice. The one who is unfaithful to God in little matters will prove unjust to him in greater ones too. Not unloving, but unjust. It is about justice, the rights of God. Since, as we saw Mother Mechtil so vividly saying, we belong to him as his property. And something that is unjust is also, by necessity, unloving, since charity is founded on justice. In speaking of fidelity and justice, our Lord is making reference to the virtue of religion, that is, the habit of giving to God that which we owe him to the best of our abilities. If we do not give him our controlled limbs, our bows, genuflections, kisses, averted eyes, and careful pronunciation of syllables in the liturgy, why would we deceive ourselves into thinking that we shall give him our mind and will, our love, our service to our neighbors? One might almost paraphrase St. John's first epistle. For he that loveth not his church's rights, which he seeth, how can he love God whom he seeth not? The school par excellence of utmost fidelity in small things, as well as great ones, is the sacred liturgy, wherein we obey little rubrics as we handle the very flesh and blood of God. Prompted by Mother Mechtild's teaching, Should we not say that a liturgy that offers the celebrant or the participant a greater number of opportunities to submit to the mind of another and serve his will, especially in the smallest details, is a liturgy that will produce more abundant fruits of holiness? If I may coin a phrase, this is nothing other than the liturgical little way. The teaching of St. Therese applied to that area in which it had always been practiced without fanfare until recent decades, when the rubrics were severely curtailed, celebrant options were multiplied, a casual approach was adopted, and a millennium of Western piety was dismissed as obscurantism. The liturgical little way consists in appreciating and paying attention to the small things of which the liturgy consists, and doing them with great care and love. During the course of the 20th century, many of these small things were clipped away. For example, bowing and genuflecting, kissing the altar, covering or uncovering the head, keeping custody of the eyes, holding the fingers together. I mean, there are hundreds of examples of this. With the abandonment of this little way came an ever-increasing flood of infidelity, impiety, and depravity. The man who does not value the little things will soon fall into great disorders. Thanks be to God, the growth of the traditional movement brings with it, perforce, a restoration of these little things. And this, in turn, gives us fair hope and reasonable confidence that someday we shall once again see great sanctity emerging from the liturgy. One can imagine an objection. Doesn't this approach that I've been describing risk becoming a form of legalism or a preoccupation with rubrics? As far as I can tell, legalism became a danger only after 1570, when a form of mass with a set of rubrics was promulgated for the first time by a pope. Prior to 1570, the clergy did certain things and avoided others due to strong custom and a sense of the fittingness of what might be called best practice. The behavior stemmed more from piety and reverence than from mere obedience to an external law. All the same, Pius V was only codifying what was already being done. The rubrics reflected time-honored custom and not the arbitrary will of a commission, as happened much later with 20th century rubrical reforms. Ultimately, however, we cannot but agree with John Henry Newman that if one truly believes in the dogma of transubstantiation, 
the dense rubricism of the Roman Missal, this proliferation of detailed rubrics, immediately becomes comprehensible, for it serves multiple awe-inspiring ends. Here's what Newman says. Open the Missal, read the minute directions given for the celebration of Mass, what are the fit dispositions under which the priest prepares for it, how he is to arrange his every action, movement, gesture, utterance during the course of it, and what is to be done in case of a variety of supposable accidents. What a mockery would all this be if the right meant nothing. But if it be a fact that God the Son is there offered up in flesh and blood by the hands of man, why, it is plain that no right whatever, however anxious and elaborate, is equal to the depth of the overwhelming thoughts which are borne in upon the mind by such an action. Thus, the usages and ordinances of the church do not exist for their own sake. They protect a mystery. They defend a dogma. They represent an idea. They preach good tidings. They are the channels of grace. What a writer Newman is. The foregoing observations should make us nervous about one of the most notable novelties in the Missal of Paul VI and in all the revised liturgical books, namely, that by which the celebrant is given many options among which he may choose, as well as opportunities for crafting his own speech in these or similar words. Confronted with the phrase, in these or similar words, one might legitimately ask, how similar is similar? In reality, the word of the liturgy and the word of the minister ought to be homoousios, of one and the same substance, not homoiousios, of a similar substance. It makes far more than one iota of difference. In the action of selecting options and extemporizing texts, the celebrant no longer perfectly reflects the word of God, who, as the perfect image of the Father, equal to him, receives his words and does not originate them, who does the will of another and not his own will. The elective and extemporizing celebrant does not show forth the fundamental identity of the Christian, one who receives and bears fruit like the Blessed Virgin Mary, one who conceives with no help of man by the descent of the Spirit alone. Instead, he adopts the posture of one who originates. He removes this sphere of action from the master to whom he reports. He carves out for himself a zone of autonomy. He denies the Lord the privilege of commanding him and deprives himself of the guerdon of submission. For a moment, he leaves the narrow way of being a tool and steps onto the broad way of being somebody. He becomes not only an actor, but a playwright. His free choice as an individual is exalted into a principle of liturgy. He joins the madding crowd that says, in the words of the psalmist, linguam nostra magnificabimus labia nostra a nobis sunt, quis noster dominus est. We will magnify our tongue, our lips are our own, who is Lord over us. But since free choice is antithetical to liturgy as a fixed ritual received from our forebears and handed down faithfully to our successors, choice tends rather to be a principle of distraction, dilution, or dissolution in the liturgy than of its well-being. The same critique may be given of all of the ways in which the new liturgy permits the celebrant an indeterminate freedom of speech, bodily bearing, and movement. Such voluntarism strikes at the essence of liturgy, which is a public, objective, formal, solemn, and common prayer in which all Christians are equally participants even when they are performing irreducibly distinct acts. The prayer of Christians belongs to everyone in common, which means it cannot belong to anyone in particular. The moment a priest invents something that is not common he sets, himself, he sets himself up as a clerical overlord vis-a-vis the people, who must now submit not to a rule of Christ and the church, but to the arbitrary rule of this individual. As we have seen, our Lord called the devil a liar because he speaks from himself. 
He vainly endeavors to pull out of his own finite mind a word that is sufficient, or we might say self-sufficient, and he always fails. Private initiative by itself can never equal the demands of the public wheel. In the liturgy more than anywhere else, we must never speak from ourselves, but only from Christ and his beloved bride, the Church. Psalm 115, which the Old Roman Missal proposes as a prayer of preparation for the celebrant, sums up everything we have been saying to this point. I said in my excess, every man is a liar. What shall I render to the Lord for all the things he hath rendered unto me? Here the psalmist admits that fallen man like the devil is a liar. He asks what he should give in response for all that the Lord has already given to him, given him in the liturgy, the spirituality, the doctrine, the discipline of the church. And he immediately continues, I will take the chalice of salvation and I will call upon the name of the Lord. As if to say, only through the liturgy itself, which does not depend on me or proceed from me, can I make an adequate return to the Lord. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Namely, that cloud of witnesses who were sanctified by this liturgy, taking its yoke upon their necks. O Lord, for I am thy servant, I am thy servant and the son of thy handmaid. I am the servant of him who became a servant for me, who serves me with his precious body and blood in exchange for my rational service. I am the son of his mother, the handmaid of the Lord. Thou hast broken my bonds, namely the bonds of self-will, self-determination, self-inflation, which hold me down to the earth, to prevailing fashion, to the spirit of the age, to the expectations of my social group or stratum, to the gross or subtle ideologies of my time. Being thus set free by the words and work of another, I will sacrifice to thee the sacrifice of praise, and I will call upon the name of the Lord. That's all Psalm 115. It's a whole catechesis on liturgy. Or as it says in Psalm 15, I have said to the Lord, Thou art my God, for thou hast no need of my goods. Thou hast no need of my goods. The Lord is the portion of my inheritance and of my cup. It is thou that wilt restore my inheritance to me. The lines are fallen unto me in goodly places, for my inheritance is goodly to me. The Lord truly has no need of our paltry goods that we think we can contribute. Rather, we have need of the goodly inheritance and the overflowing cup he has prepared for us over the ages and now offers to us in lines of prayer and rubric set forth in front of our eyes and placed into our hand. The lines are fallen unto me in goodly places. There is a provocative line in Psalm 19, Holocaustum tuum pingue fiat, and may thy whole burnt offering be made fat. In a number of places, scripture goes on about fat sacrifices. Why? The animal to be offered to the Lord should be the best that one has, not only unblemished, but robustly healthy from being fed on ample quantities of the best provender. This sacrificial animal represents us. We want to give the Lord everything, the fat of our thoughts, volitions, passions, words, actions. No thin gruel is worthy of him, no partial flank, no rationing in coffee spoons. He wants all of us for himself. When we follow the path of traditional liturgy, our sacrifice is both fat, because nothing is left outside the reach of the rubrics, and a holocaust, which is all burned up for him in obedience. The fruit of this obedience to an external rule over which one has or exercises no control is an immense interior peace. Jesus tells us, without me, you can do nothing. As Jacques Maritain observes, this statement can be taken two ways, in its obvious meaning and in a paradoxical meaning. 
At face value, our Lord is saying that without him, without his grace, without the branch living from the sap of the vine, we cannot do anything supernaturally good, pleasing to God, or meritorious of eternal life. But our Lord is also telling us, when you act without me, what you end up doing is precisely nothing. When you act on your own, you are perfectly capable of doing nothing. And the more you act apart from me, the more nothingness you will produce. It's as if one were to say, the one thing I can do apart from Christ is to sin, to introduce disorder or to render something duller, flatter, or emptier than it was or would have been. This too has liturgical implications. Should we be surprised that the churches have emptied when the very presuppositions of the liturgical form and its rubrics allow us to do whatever is in our heads. Apart from Christ, we do nothing well, and the result is nothing good. The deepest cause of the missionary collapse of the church in the Western world is that we have lost our institutional and personal subordination to Christ, the high priest, the principal actor in the liturgy, the word to whom we lend our mouth, our hands, our bodies, our souls. For the past 50 years, maybe 60 years, it has not been perfectly clear that we are in fact ministers and servants of another, intelligent instruments wholly at his disposal. On the contrary, the opposite message has been promoted over and over again, ad nauseam, whether in words or in deeds. We have come of age, We are shaping the world, the church, the mass, the entire Christian life according to our own lights and for our own purposes. It is not difficult to see that this is an inversion of the preaching of Christ and the tradition of the church, and that it will not and cannot produce renewal, but rather confusion, infidelity, boredom, and desolation. We see here an exact parallel to what has happened with marriage. When so-called free love entered into the picture, out went committed love and heroic sacrifice, and in came lust, selfishness, dissatisfaction, and an unspeakable plague of loneliness. Without me, you can do nothing. In the realm of sexual morality, as in the realm of liturgical morality, we have given a compelling demonstration of what we can accomplish without Christ, and without his gift of tradition, namely, nothing. As if she had suddenly developed an autoimmune disease, the rulers of the Catholic Church in the 20th century turned against her own ecclesiastical traditions, her own greatness in music, art, and architecture, against her very rites and ceremonies in a sterile love affair with nothingness. We have witnessed an inbreaking of the underworld, an influx of demonic energy and chaos. It does no good to pretend that we are dealing with anything less harmful than this, less dangerous, or less in need of exorcism. But we need not conclude on a dark note. We know that everything that happens is either a good willed by God because it is pleasing to him, or an evil permitted by God who, in his omnipotence, can bring forth some greater good from it. For example, by the testing of the saints and the purification of the church. Are we in a position to see some of the goods he has drawn out of the divine permission of the liturgical revolution and its diabolic elements? First, precisely because of its near extinction, The traditional liturgy has never been more loved, treasured, studied, and promoted as it now is on the part of those who are working to restore it to the place of honor it deserves. From what I can tell in my historical research, the authentic liturgy was sometimes marred in its beauty by a complacent or compromised Ars Celebrandi, or was too much taken for granted as an immovable piece of furniture in the rambling old Catholic mansion. One sees in the Old Testament that the Lord frequently deprives his people of goods of which they no longer strive to be worthy and for which they seldom or never thank him. This is a severe mercy, to be sure, but it is a mercy nonetheless, urging us to take seriously things that must be taken seriously, if they are not to be taken away altogether. 
Thou hast shown thy people hard things. Thou hast given us to drink the wine of compunction. That's from Psalm 95. Second, I believe that we are capable of being much more on our guard now. The enemy of human nature has shown his cards, and we are better prepared to detect his wiles. I would include in this category the flurry of thinking and writing that has taken place in recent years about the inherent limits of papal authority, the obligation of the Pope to act as servant of the servants of God rather than an Oriental or South American despot, and the inner connection between liturgy, dogma, and morals. The truth of the axiom lex orandi, lex credendi, lex vivendi is now manifest in a blazing light of obviousness that multiplies the lovers of tradition and exposes the modernism of their opponents past all gainsaying. Third, we have now a lived experience of what happens when the principles of liturgy are distorted or discarded. Never before has such a tragic experiment been attempted. But since the laws of nature and of grace always remain the same, the experiment was doomed to fail. The rotten fruits of the post-conciliar tree are plain for all to see. This painful experience has made us both more cautious and, in many cases, more insistent on good liturgy, on careful celebration, on appropriate adornments in the sanctuary, splendid vestments, and well-executed sacred music. One might say, those who care, care more. And this process will only intensify as the Vatican II nostalgics drop out of this world one by one. Each liturgically vibrant parish or chapel, each observant monastery or convent, each faithful family or school, each level-headed society or association, by putting into practice the liturgical little way remaining faithful to the smallest details of tradition, will have its part to play in the unexpected triumph of David, singer of psalms, over the swaggering Goliath of fabricated liturgy. Thank you very much for your kind attention. I I was planning on on taking questions from the audience, if you would like to pose any. Yes, please. Right, so let me just address that first. Um, The drama of the times we're living in is that Catholics are being torn in half, if if they're aware of what's going on, by which I mean if they're aware of of the history of the past 50 years, essentially since the Second Vatican Council, um, and especially the last 10 years under Pope Francis, we're being, we're being torn in different directions that, we're not, that are not supposed, to, we're not supposed to be torn in different directions like this. There should never be a conflict between obedience to the Pope and obedience to the tradition of the Church. 
Um, and the fact that these things have, are now clashing is an alarming sign of the crisis. And I think this is what traditionalists say, is that something has gone wrong here. When you, have, when you no longer have all of the parts aligning with each other in harmony, but you now have competing principles of authority. Now, the thing that I think is very important is, is that um, a certain decision has to be made about how you're going to construe papal authority. Is papal authority so absolute that essentially tradition means nothing anymore? That the Pope can do whatever he wants, uh, save for a very narrowly defined scope of a sphere of things. He, he has no obligations whatsoever towards the tradition of the church. And that's something that, for example, Joseph Ratzinger strongly spoke against. He said, this is a false conception of the papacy. And in my books, I quote many, many theologians saying, this is a false conception of the papacy. So when, the, when it can never be in itself wrong or disobedient to adhere to the tradition, traditional liturgy of the church. On the contrary, the traditional liturgy was the touchstone of orthodoxy. It was because we celebrate with this handed down right, we know that we're going along the right path in terms of what we believe and how we're living and how we're worshiping. Um, where, I think, where I think your point is valid is we do have to continually examine our consciences and, and our motivations to make sure that we're not doing any particular thing simply out of a spirit of stubbornness or rebellion because we have a personal hatred or animosity or annoyance even with someone or some policy. Um, I think it, it's, this is difficult. I'm not going to beat around the bush and say oh, this is an easy affair. Um, but I do think that when you realize what's at stake with the liturgy, and that's what I tried to bring out, uh, maybe even melodramatically by bringing in you know, uh, Lucifer and trying to analyze all of these things, is that there's a, there's a more radical form of disobedience that is seen in that sphere, a, a more, a more um, subversive one, a more ultimately acidic, dissolving kind of, of problem, and that has to be addressed, that can't be run away from. However we address it, and whatever difficulties that, that involves, we have to address it, right? Um, getting to the Eucharistic fast, I, I mean, I do think that, first of all, it would be entirely possible for the church to say, normally everyone should fast before communion from midnight, um, except on Holy Thursday and the Easter Vigil. I mean, that's, there are, you know, that's not too complicated. I think most modern people can grasp you know, <laughs> these kind of distinctions. And if they made a mistake in good faith, they wouldn't be you know, culpable for anything. Um, I think the main reduction I have in mind is, from, is, is to one hour. That, that seems almost... Aristotle says in one of his works that... Um, that that which is very small seems to be nothing. And I think that that's true about the one hour fast. I mean, in many cases, what that means is that you have to be careful to finish your donut before you get into the garage. You know, like it's, it's like one hour before communion. If you happen to go to a church where the mass takes a while, like say more than an hour, that's, I guess that's not all that common in the, in the Novus Ordo sphere. But, but if, if, you know, you could be eating right until practically you left for mass. That's not a fast. That's not a Eucharistic fast. Nobody could take that seriously. It's, it's hardly a sacrifice at all. Um, you know, and again, we're talking about healthy people, you know, about people who can, who are able to fast, right? Not the ill or, or pregnant and nursing mothers. We're just talking about people who are perfectly able to fast. All of us could fast a lot more than we do. Um, three hours, though, is a much more serious fast, because then you really have to think ahead of time. Like, I'm going to go to Mass at 12. That means, you know, I need to stop drinking my coffee at 10 o'clock in the morning. At least there you have to be thoughtful. You have to plan ahead, and you have to make at least a little bit of a sacrifice, right? It's some kind of sacrifice. The midnight fast, though, is very ancient. That is the traditional fast. Every church father assumed that the first food to enter the mouth of a Christian was the supernatural food, the bread of life. So if you were going to receive communion, the expectation for Christianity for, we're talking now for close to 2,000 years, was that the first food you would taste is the Eucharist. And all human food had to be after that. That is so meaningful and so beautiful. Um, and I think that we need to recover that. Um, and so it would be easier, frankly, for I think for all of us, 
to do that under obedience. That is, if we were told you have to do that, then we'd be like, okay, we have to do it, you know? Just like we do on Ash Wednesday we, or Good Friday, we have to do it. So if we're, gonna, if we're gonna be practicing Catholics, we need to do it. It's, it's harder to do something like that just because you voluntarily decide to do it. And then there's also a little bit of danger of pride for some people. Like, you know, I'm, I'm better than the rest of the Catholics because I'm doing this midnight fast. And, and that's the, the irony. The irony is that Paul VI when he, re- when he simplified and eliminated so much fasting from Catholic life, he said the motivation was to free up Catholics to more generously sacrifice on their own without even thinking about the psychology of that. We, we need to have rules imposed on us in order to develop virtuous habits. If you don't have those rules, you're never going to develop those virtuous habits, right? So Paul, Paul VI strikes me as a terribly naive person. I mean, when, when you read what he writes... Uh, about the liturgy and about asceticism, it's all very much based on this kind of optimistic view that modern people are, they have lots of intelligence and goodwill and they're just ready to do voluntarily everything that they should do. I mean, I don't know about you, but I haven't met that many people like that, you know, so. Yes, sir. It always occurs to me that we have, we're, we're many of us now trying to preserve the Latin trying to deal with traditional studies. But I often think there's also a second way forward that we don't think of as much. Mm -hmm. And that is, if there were not just a Latin mass society, but also a a reverential novus ordo society. To, 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 that you talked about the best practices before, uh, you know, 15, 17, Mm -hmm. uh, that were just done because they were best practices. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, I mean, I, I, much prefer going to the traditional Latin Mass, but when I go to the Lucasoro Mass and kneel, I'm one of the three people or whatever, yes. or five people that kneel and take me on the tongue, it's like a witness to yes. uh, uh, one of those best practices. Right. And we need to maybe reach out to see if we can uh, traditionalize, mm-hmm. use that flexibility in the Lucasoro Yeah, it's... <sighs> I have a lot of conflicted feelings about this question. Um, the, the, the most basic problem of all is that what you're describing is exactly what Pope Benedict intended to do with Summorum Pontificum and what in fact was happening. And that's why the enemies of tradition uh, issued the, the uh, ironically named Traditionis Custodes uh, because they wanted to stop the Novus Order from being, from being reconnected with tradition as Pope Benedict had intended. Um, so. We, we have that basic difficulty to deal with it, that a lot of bishops now are even saying that if you celebrate the Novus Ordo facing east, or if you give communion to people kneeling, that you're bringing old, you're bringing old practices into the new mass, even though technically that's not true, because all those things are permitted. Um, the real difficulty, I think, I, I put it this way, the only way that a priest celebrating the Novus Ordo could avoid the problems that I described is if he was able to make a vow to always celebrate ad orientem, always with the Roman canon, always in Latin with chant, never any Eucharistic ministers, etc. People kneeling. Like you, you'd ha- he'd, have to, he'd have to commit himself as much as was in his power always to do the same thing in order to recover something of the spirit of being a living tool that Monsignor Ronald Knox describes. And that has a couple of difficulties. The first difficulty is that it's, it would be a personal vow, so it's still a, a, something he's doing himself, um, and, and it's not something that's simply given to him, imposed upon him, something received. So it brings with it the, the, the problem that I was mentioning with fasting, which is that you, can, you could think well of yourself and other people could think well of you for making a good choice when you shouldn't have had to make that choice to begin with. But the other and much more concrete difficulty is that a priest like that is going to get creamed. I mean, he, he's not going to survive for three weeks because nobody's going to let him follow all of the best practices. You know, Susan or Karen or whoever is going to be on her cell phone instantly to the chancery complaining about this renegade, you know, rad trad Novus Ordo priest, right? And so um, I, I feel as if in certain hothouse environments, things like that do happen, like, like the Brompton Oratory in London. They've been doing the Novus Ordo in a Tridentine fashion for 50 years now. Nobody bothers them. It's simply what they do. Nobody, I think nobody would think of telling them to do anything else. But it, it's, it's just, it's a shame to me that it's so difficult to get to that point. It's almost like the deck 
is stacked against it. You know? And that's what's so beautiful about the traditional right is that it's a whole package deal. It's all or nothing. You know, and just like just to give you an example of that, right? With the Novus Ordo, you know, they under the rubric or under the guise, I should say, of flexibility, of pastoral adaptability, you can sing whatever you want or not sing it. So you can sing the Kyrie but recite the Gloria, you can sing in Latin and in English, and you can mix and match like that. Well, what that often produces is something liturgically incoherent, like a mass where the only thing sung is the Alleluia. Well, why is that? You know, that's not the most important thing in the Mass. Um, Whereas in the traditional rite, it's all or nothing. You either have to sing every last thing in a Missa Cantata or a Missa Solemnis, or you don't sing it at all, right? And sometimes people say, wow, that's so strict. You know, shouldn't there be flexibility? Well, no, because it's this whole spirit of you take it as a whole thing and you... And what what the effect of having to sing everything is that it drives people to the excellence of let's really make it work. Let's work hard to do the whole sung mass. Instead of saying, oh, let's sing this, that, whatever, we can you know, manage this kind of lackadaisical attitude, right? So really the way forward is the tradition. It's, got, it's, it's figured it out. Everything's been figured out. Yeah. Yes. What will happen to the goal of the practice? You know, it's still next year. It's two years. Yeah. Right, right. Well, you know, it's, it's very strange. Um, many of you, I'm sure, who follow these uh, issues are aware of how differently Traditionis Custodis has been implemented in different places. And, I mean, it's, it's like the church now is, is like a checkerboard. Um, not, you know, the, the claim that this will bring about more unity is exactly the opposite. Uh, it's, you can have two dioceses now that are like West and East Germany in the old days, you know? And it's like, if you go across the border, there's freedom for tradition. If you, if you go in the other direction, it's, you know, Stalingrad or whatever. Um, and so there's, there's a lot more diversity now and, and, uh, and, and contradiction. And I think that there are some dioceses where um, bishops, bishops have done some very clever things to try to get around these, you know, rules about you can only do this for two years. For example, when a bishop invites in the Institute of Christ the King or the Fraternity of St. Peter, it's, it's true that it, it was more beautiful when the diocesan clergy were doing all of this, but in a time of war right now, which is what we're in, um, the, it seems like for now, the, these, these Ecclesia Dei communities, uh, again, they're, they're, they were created to do just one thing, and all of their clergy only do one thing. And so when a bishop creates a chapel or an oratory and brings in the Institute of the Fraternity, it's, it's a way for the, for the Latin Mass of Latin Sacraments to be given a long lease on life. Now, if, if the Pope tries to crack down further, if Cardinal Roach, Cardinal Brazaviz, this whole gallery... Uh, of characters, if they try to crack down even further, there are going, and, and they try to prohibit things or abolish things completely, then I think we're going to see um, a lot of different kinds of responses. I think you will see some priests who simply refuse to go along with that and who essentially become independent clergy. Um, I think you will find some who join the SSPX. I think you will find uh, some who go along with it, um, but maybe secretly do what they can to help the faithful. I mean, I think you'll see lots of different kinds of, it'll be like the 1970s, which is exactly where we are. We're back to the 1970s. In the 1970s, the bomb that was dropped on the tradition of the church was so unexpected and so cataclysmic that people ran off and did many different sorts of things. Um, And later on, as time went on, a lot of like this, a lot of, I know for I know several cases where independent chapels were later reconciled with the diocese once more peaceful times ca- had come, once there was a more generous attitude from the Vatican. Um, and I think that that also, I actually have confidence that the present war against tradition is going to end. I, it doesn't have it doesn't have the wherewithal to continue. Um, it's it's being the people who are who are opposing the traditional liturgy right now are their own worst enemies. They're, they're a terrible advertisement for, uh, I mean, they're basically, they're progressives in morality, they're modernists in theology. No serious believing Catholics wants to be like that and wants to follow that policy. Uh, and I think that the, the younger generations who are groaning under the weight of this will eventually take over and will bring back some more liturgical peace. That's what I think.
going to happen. Yes, sir. Yes, I think that uh, perhaps you comment on what you say. I'm trying to put it in the form of a question. Um, in 1970, I was a lot younger than I am now. My grandfather took me to a neighboring cache. He said, something's going on. When we pulled up, we stayed in the car. And out in front of the church on the sidewalk were sacred objects, including statues. Mm. They obviously had been removed from the church. Mm. And then they had a device like a crane to pick them up. The first one was the statue of the Blessed Virgin Mary. It smacked it. What did Cardinal Christian know about that? Mm -hmm. That's a rhetorical question. They paid for that. Mm -hmm. They didn't ask the thing. And they right. were smashing them one by one. I wanted yeah. my grandfather to stop them because I thought he could do anything. Yeah. And I started crying and told him to move away. In my own parish, to this day, I don't know. We walked in, and this was after the mass change. All this was after the mass change. Well, the communion rail was on, but also they didn't have all the statues. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't do their smashing. But they were gone to this day. Yes. You know, St. Joseph, Jesus, they were all gone, all gone. You cannot say to St. Michael the Archangel prayer after mass. None of this. There was no explanation, there was no consultation. They are supposed to be populous, they listen to the... Yes. It, well, right, and, and that's, that's another reason to be, to be um, cautiously optimistic about the, the long-term situation. It's that people know a lot more now than they did in the 60s and 70s. The, the faithful were not prepared for what happened. But once it happened, and once people had a chance to reflect on it and write about it, and then once the internet came into the picture, and now you could, everybody in the world, because of, well, largely because of Francis, everybody knows about the traditional Latin mass. Everybody can watch it on videos. They can look at photographs. You know, there's, we have so much more now in terms of, of understanding of why this, this, uh, this anti-traditional approach is wrong. Um, that, you know, they might have the power, but they don't have the truth behind them, and we can see that. And power without truth tends to consume itself and to destroy itself. And that's, that's what you see with all dictatorships, right? Um, I mean, in 1939, 1940, the situation in Europe looked very bleak. But five years later, it was a totally different story, right? Um, and the, the, the most powerful advanced evil empires had crumbled under the weight of their own evil, right? Um, that is really what I think is going to happen with this whole affair. Good, we'll, we'll stop there. Thank you so much for coming this evening. <clears throat>